Welcome to Bible Study St. Paul. This is Revelation 19, and I am Vicar Josh. We are have been, through the past several weeks, months actually, been walking through the book of Revelation just to see what we can take out of it, how it applies to our lives, hopefully get into understanding what is going on in the book a little bit better. And this is the next chapter in that. This is chapter 19 which follows from what we saw last week in chapter 18, and that was a vision of judgment. And it was a vision of judgment on this character that has been coming up throughout Revelation that I, a couple weeks ago, I started calling the Faithless One. And if you want to see a, a more in-depth explanation of why I did that, why I do that, go ahead and watch Revelation 17. Because my explanation is in that video. But, kind of beside the point. So we see the punishment of the faithless one. And then we see, kind of, the way the world mourns for her loss. And this is all in chapter 18. And then, at the close of 18, we see the celebration of the saints. At, at God's victory. At God's final judgment. At the, at the justice and, and power of God. So that's what we see as we step into this chapter, into chapter 19, where we see worship and praise of God and, and kind of this final battle. We see an image of Jesus coming in his glory to conquer in a way that he, he did not in his first, uh, first coming. And uh, we kind of, we get to see the incredible nature of that. So with that, we are going to step into the text we're gonna get straight after it into revelation 19 and as always i encourage you have your text with you ha have whether that is a physical copy of the bible whether that's your phone that you're taking out and you're reading off your phone because while i throw the text up while i'm reading it i do switch to this video of myself while i'm explaining and walking through and it makes it a little bit easier to follow along if you actually have the text in front of you so i would encourage you if you don't have a bible in front of you in some fashion go ahead and pause this video and go get one and then we'll come back and uh we're going to start with just the first four verses we're going to start with revelation 19 1 through 4. so what that reads is after this i heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And that's the four verses we have there. And kind of explain, this is a celebrating crowd of angels and saints in heaven. That's this great multitude that is being talked about in the very first verse of the chapter. And they're celebrating for the readiness of the bride. They're celebrating for the defeat of the faithless one. They're, they're celebrating for kind of, this is the, the conclusion of God's plan. They don't have to wait anymore for it. Um, and first and foremost, the celebration is for God's judgment and for him finally acting that judgment out. It's, Salvation belonged to our God for his judgments are true and just uh, he has he has judged the great prostitute, the faithless one who corrupted the earth, and has avenged the blood of his saints. And that is a celebration that they're speaking directly to. Is they're crying out celebration because they've been avenged. God has taken vengeance on their behalf. And like we've had this discussion multiple different times, it is sometimes a struggle for us to think that vengeance is not ours. We do not seek to defend ourselves, to, to get revenge or vengeance for ourselves, which I think is a little contrary to what our culture speaks to. I think our culture operates much more with this attitude of an eye for an eye, or a, a movie my dad liked to quote, 
they I don't know if it was a movie or a show actually they send one of yours to the hospital you send one of theirs to the morgue and we have this idea of kind of getting back and taking justice into our own hands and in reality God the the ability to judge is God's alone and as we look at this and it says salvation and, and glory and power belong to our God and we kind of have this picture of saints celebrating because justice is God's and his alone there's this reality I think that th I think this is a favorite sin of a lot of Christians this this desire to judge the desire to judge for ourselves it, it makes us feel better somehow and, and I think the reality of it the, the reason I call it so casually and so readily a sin is because it gets in the way of us sharing the gospel because the reality is even though we we can read the scriptures and we can understand on some level God's judgment and we can understand his law to some extent our understanding is still imperfect and it is still not our place to judge we are, we're, of course, called to share our understandings and, and what we are taught through the scriptures. But it is not our place to judge based on that because our understanding is imperfect. So any form of judgment, it, it, it is God's, it is not ours because we don't understand. We, we don't have this fullness of understanding from which we can make judgments. So a little bit of a tangent there. And then as we go forward, there's the second hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And this, this is a confirmation of the eternal nature of her punishment. This character that represents all of the false spirituality, false Christianity, false religion that takes people away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. The punishment for that is eternal. And then this, this section concludes with everyone bowing down and worshiping God. The 24 living elders, the four living creatures, the, these are the highest servants of God. And even they are bowing down and they're worshiping him at this point. And with that, we're going to continue. And we're only going to go one verse forward. We're going to go into verse 5, which says, And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and you who fear him small and great so that's what we have in verse 5 this is a spoken invitation to the servants of God to maybe a bit of a more honest way to put it the slaves of God of which you and I are we are servants of God we are slaves of God this is all of God's people fall into this category small and great uh, and this is an invitation to celebrate, to celebrate that God's final judgment is here, that the, the second coming is here, that the end of times is here, because it means the restoration of us and God and the relationship there is complete and its fullness is being revealed. So that's what we have in, in verse five really quick. And it's kind of, uh, a little bit of an interruption between, I guess, the rest of the narrative here. And with that, we're going to step forward into the narrative, obviously, to verse 6. And we're going to go to Revelation 19, verses 6 through 10, which says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, You, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant of Christ with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And that's what we see in the next five verses 
of Revelation 19. So as we step through this, this voice of a great multitude is referenced a couple times in Revelation. And this is, in reality, this is the saints, this is the angels, this is servants of God speaking together in a mighty, powerful, synchronized voice. And as it steps into what they're celebrating, they're celebrating God taking his reign. And what I want to be clear about here is he's, he's taking his reign, but not in the sense that he ever lost it. You see, God rules graciously with grace and mercy, but that reign was interrupted by, by our fall by the sin of mankind. And his reign wasn't interrupted, but the gracious reign was interrupted by one of power and judgment. So what we see here is the restoration of God's gracious reign, which is, uh, you know, phenomenal news for us. And then we, we go into this imagery of a divine marriage, of the marriage of the Lamb has come, his bride is has made herself ready, um, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the reality is that this is deeply rooted in Old Testament imagery for God's relationship with his people, as with his people as the bride or the bridegroom. Um, and, or, and what it is frequently referred to as we go forward, especially in the New Testament frequently, it's almost referred to as a, an engagement period, which has this reality of, of in, in the time that it was written, there was a, a bit of a different attitude toward marriage. The, the two, well, I guess it still kind of s continues on today, but there were two really significant parts of marriage. There was the betrothal, and then there was the marriage. And the betrothal was when the bride, pro the, the, groom the groom to be uh paid the bride price to the father of the bride and and kind of that transaction and the reason i bring these details up is because i mean it's really cool symbolism when you think of the the marriage and the relationship there that is reflected between us as the church and christ but especially that aspect of the bride price because in, in the New Testament, when we're talking more about engagement, betrothal language, that's before Christ died, before he paid the bride price that was his own blood. And then what we see as we step forward, as we walk forward into this, which is the, the marriage, we, the, the bride, the church is ready for this marriage. The price has been paid. There's nothing left but celebration. So we kind of see that that cool imagery. Um, one note, I guess I do want to throw in there. It's It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. That is the righteous deeds of the saints. Um, there are a couple different interpretations of this, but it can very easily be misinterpreted. So I do want to address that. Um, so there is this reality that the saints' robes are made white with the blood of the Lamb. That their presence in heaven... Their, their cleanliness, their righteousness before God is only through Christ's sacrifice. It's not through their own work, which is important. It, it's fundamental to our relationship with God, to our entire faith. Because without that sacrifice, we're incapable of doing any of that on our own. But this is suggesting that the, the righteous deeds of the saints are playing into this finery uh, that's preparing the bride for her wedding. So the, the suggestion here is that uh, maybe it's it's like a cloak over. It's adornment in addition to and only possible because of the white robes made white by the blood of the Lamb. And I think what this gets to is, is something called sanctification, which is a theological term. And um, for those of you who know me personally, you know I... Not a huge fan of terms that aren't accessible to 99% of the people in the room. So I'm going to use it because I think it's really helpful, but I do want to explain it. So sanctification is this, is separate and distinct from justification. 
Justification is the need to live in accordance of God's law to please God. And the need for our justification was removed, was paid off by Jesus' sacrifice. Sanctification, on the other hand, has absolutely nothing to do with our salvation. Sanctification are, are the good works, are the righteous works, are the, the following of God's law that naturally follows from the gift we've been given. From the need for our justification being taken away. It's, it's kind of like this, we're, we, we sin, we, we fall before God and we say, there's nothing I can do. And God says, I'm taking care of it. So our response is, that's awesome. What do I do now? How do I thank you? And God says, here's my will for you. And that is sanctification. So if we fail to live a sanctified life, does it take away our justification? Not in the slightest. But we, we do our best to live a sanctified life, to live according to God's law, because that's what he wants for us. That's the joy that he has in store for us. We don't do it to earn something. We do it just because we, we love God and that's how we respond to him. So there's, there's some speaking to maybe those righteous deeds are adornment over and above the, the kind of access pass into heaven. So um, we, we talked about the bride price and then going forward, there is this fourth blessing. Um, that says, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper. And this is the fourth blessing in the book of Revelation. And John is overwhelmed at this point by the person speaking the word of God. He, the angel says, these are the true words of God. And John is overwhelmed and he falls down at the feet of the angel at this messenger to worship him. And immediately the angel says, you must not do that. I'm, I'm just a servant like you. And I, I want to hone in on this a little bit because John is overwhelmed by the person speaking the word into his life, into his reality. So he's, there's this temptation to worship him and it's not right. You see, because speakers of God's word shouldn't be worshipped. You don't praise the messenger, you praise God. It's, um, I don't know how good of an example this is, but kind of, just thinking about it now, this is being recorded. I, I, If you're watching this recently after recording, this is being recorded shortly after stimulus checks have gone out to a lot of people from the federal government. Are people, like, if you were to thank an entity, say you got the $1,200 stimulus check in your bank account, um... Are you going to thank your bank for transferring the money into your account? Or are you going to thank the federal government that sent the money in the first place? If you're thanking an entity, at least logically to me, it seems more appropriate to thank the source of the gift. Just like if someone sends me a birthday gift in the mail, I mean, I might, I might thank the the UPS guy for dropping it off, but I'm not thanking him for the gift. I call or I write a note or, or whatever. And I thank the person who sent the gift in the same way. We're called to worship God, not the people who share his gifts and his messages with us. Um, so my, this is my first discussion question for you today. And it should be below. I know we've been having some trouble with uh, comments being restricted on certain devices or certain videos but it should be below this opportunity to just talk about what are some ways we fall into this trap today. And I'm, I'm going to talk about one just that I have seen in that uh, when we were together, when we were worshiping together, when we were in the sanctuary together. I would have people, and I, after I preached, I would have people come up as they were shaking my hand out the door and they would be incredibly complimentary to me. And I, I appreciate it. I do. Um, side note on my personality, because of my own character flaws, uh, 
I find it incredibly hard to actually take any compliments. My wife can attest to this because it drives her nuts. I cannot take compliments. I am incapable of it. So whenever anyone says something incredibly complimentary to me, my first response is, oh, you're being really nice. Beside the point. But I, I think this is, this is a mistake. Because the words I speak are not mine. The message is not mine. I'm just sharing what I've found. I'm just sharing the word and the gifts of God. Um, and even if you were saying, well, maybe it wasn't the message, it was how the message was given. Any talents, any ability I have is God working through me. Like, I, I don't deserve any of the credit for it. So I, I do my best to respond, well, I'm glad to hear God was working today. Or I'm glad to hear uh, the Spirit the spirit was working. Um, because I think that's where the credit should be given. And if I were to be standing outside a sanctuary once we're back together and I preach a sermon and people are going to reply to me, the Spirit was moving today. I felt God working in my life today. If I were to hear nothing but that, I would be ecstatic. I would be grinning ear to ear for the rest of the day, probably for the rest of the week. Because the credit is never the messenger. The credit goes to God. Um, so that's just, I think, one example kind of of where we sometimes fall into this trap today. Uh, but I, I would like your discussion below on what are some other ways maybe we fall into this trap today. So with that, go ahead, pause your video, comment below, and then as we return, we're going to go into Revelation 19, starting at verse 11, going to verse 17. Um, and there, there's our question. What are some ways we worship God's messengers instead of God today? So verse 11 to 16, we see... Then I saw, and this is John, then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. He has a name written that no one knows by him but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine <coughs> linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So what we see here in, in these six verses, we see um, a vision of Jesus. Uh, and a lot of these descriptions of him, you can see bits and pieces of them throughout the, the rest of Revelation and, and throughout a lot of the Old, Old Testament prophecies. And even you see glimpse of, glimpses of it in the New Testament when he returns to his disciples. But we're seeing he's coming, as he promised, to destroy the evil nations. He's coming in power. He's conquering by the word of his mouth. Um, this is kingly royalty. This is sovereignty. This is all coming together in this image of a warrior. So, and here's my second discussion question for you based on this text right here. And the question is, how do you typically picture God? Because I think a lot of times this isn't how we picture him. We, we picture him, well, frankly, a lot of people picture him as a, like a grandfather up in the sky, or some people talk about him like he's a genie where you pray and he grants wishes or something. So there are a lot of different images we have of God, including the one that is everywhere, and I don't know why, of some white guy with really long hair and baby blue eyes and a beard that's very nicely trimmed. Um, I don't know where that came from. So there's, this is kind of a tangent. Just so you know, Jesus was not white. Um, he was Middle Eastern. 
I don't have anything more to say on that. It's just, it's something that got pointed out to me in, uh, when I was a, a student at Vanderbilt. Um, one of the teachers, because I took a lot of education classes, but toward the end of my program, I knew I wanted to be a pastor. So I, I would approach my professors and say, hey, this assignment that we have that's more designed for classroom teaching, would it be okay if I adapted it to a church setting? And most, I think actually all of them were like, okay, yeah, sure, we'll do that. And, and they graded kind of the educational content of that. And one of them was how, it was a class, and I think the assignment was like, what are some ways you can make a, the physical space of the classroom more comfortable for uh, people of minority descent or different races? I don't, I don't remember how it was worded. Um, and, and the professor brought up that, like, in a lot of churches, you see pictures of Jesus, and Jesus is white. And it's the first time I ever thought about it, but, he, like, he grew up in Israel. He was born <laughs> in the Middle East to Middle Eastern parents. Um, this is a total tangent, so we're going to jump back on. But my, my question remains, how do you typically picture God? So, going forward, it talks about a new name that no one knows. Um, that includes me. So I have no more details for you on this new name that no one knows because no one knows it. You'll have to wait for the second coming to find out. So, but what we see here finally is Jesus as the word incarnate, which is something we see a couple times. We see, especially in the beginning of the gospel, um, we see Jesus as the word and the word was with God. And it's talking about the beginning of creation. And then the word became flesh. And that's the first, we, we see this connection of Jesus to the word of God becoming flesh. And here we see that pretty explicitly as Jesus called the word of God. And that's what we see here in this vision of Jesus. And then we continue and we see what he did as we go into Revelation 19, starting at verse 17, going to the 21st verse. It says, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. And with a loud voice, he called to all the birds that fly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and it with the false prophet who was in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. The two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. This is a dark image. Um, an angel announces, first of all, we start off, and an angel is standing in the sun. So this angel is standing in Jesus' glory. And it's announcing the final and complete victory of God. All of the enemies have either been slain or cast into hell. That's what we're seeing. This is a complete and total victory. And what's really interesting is this banquet comes so near after this allusion to a wedding banquet. So we see this really stark contrast. The, there's the celebratory banquet of the saints, of those who are the people of God at the end of days. And then we see this banquet of the birds for, I guess, the ones who are outside of Christ. For those who are left um, and who die in this final battle. And it's this horrible fate for people who oppose God. And then we see Satan and his servants cast into eternal suffering. So all of the followers of Satan, all those who have pledged themselves to Satan, are fallen. There, there is nothing left for them. And that's, that's where this chapter ends. And next week we get into um, a little bit more about that. But for this week, that's where we end. The fact that there is no victory for Satan. There's nothing to salvage from his defeat. He is completely and totally defeated. 
by our conquering Lord, um, who fights on our behalf. So I think that's actually in, in the midst of kind of the dark imagery that chapter 19 closes with. I think that is a comforting thought that someone that powerful is fighting on our behalf. So with that, um, this has been Revelation Bible Study hosted by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida, um, where I am the vicar. Please, if you haven't already, uh, there should be a button appearing in one of these top corners to subscribe to the YouTube channel. You can always write below the video. There's also a subscribe button. I would encourage you to hit that because I am not the only one who does Bible studies for St. Paul. We have Pastor Andrew just this week started a, or just this past week, started a Bible study called Foundations in Faith that really get back to the core of what does it mean to be a Christian? What does faith in God look like? And how do we, how do we explain ourselves? How do we describe what we believe? So we have that from Pastor Andrew. We have daily devotions coming out from Pastor Steve. Right now he's walking through the book of Matthew and he, he it's really cool how he's doing that. Um, live worship services every Sunday at nine and at 1045. We have chapel services for the kids and, and some other stuff that just comes. So subscribe so you get that in your feed. You get that in your notifications. Um, with that, I have no sh no more shameless plugs for you. This has been Revelation 19. And what I want to close with is if you have any remaining questions or comments or concerns or anything else, please post them below. I will check. I will comment. Um, and we will get to those. So with that. All I have left to say to you is, brothers and sisters, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.